The weather is very, very important to us. It actually affects every single aspect of our lives. Before I came to Iceland, I checked the weather. I'm super happy that I did. My umbrella was handy last night. I'm sure it was for many of you. Uh, farmers are, it's essential for farming, when to plant the crops, when to take uh, and when to harvest the crops. So I'm delighted today for the first time to be able to have the weather channel uh, have a look at what's happening for the first time in history, actually, in the high seas. Thank you so much, Gillian. And we've got wonderful new technology here at the Weather Channel, and we are able to deliver a point forecast for the Arctic high seas. And we'll take one location that is north of the northernmost part of Canada, near the Mian Islands. And as you might expect, it's going to be very chilly indeed here. Temperatures will, for the most part, only get up into the negative 20s Celsius through the entire week. So you want to take an extra pair of knickers should you be here anytime soon. And we'll take you to another spot on the other side of the Arctic Ocean, and that is north of Russia, northeast of the Anzu Islands, and similarly, it's going to be quite cold. Temperatures in the negative numbers all across the board right through the end of the week, getting a little bit warmer going into Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Now back to you in Iceland. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm obviously thrilled today because that is a first for the Arctic, it is a first for the high seas, and it's a first for the Weather Channel. So what's this focus on the weather? It, it's really exciting, of course, that now for the first time in history we have the weather for the high seas in the Arctic. Uh, that's about 1% of the high seas in total. But what that really means is that almost half the planet we have no weather for. Think about that for a second. That's almost half the planet that we don't have full, and, uh, full data for the weather. And as we know with our friends from Google and our friends from the fisheries, data is key, especially in today's world. So as exciting that is, I just want to talk a little bit about exploration. So we spend, uh, NASA's uh, space exploration budget is about 250 times more than that of our ocean exploration budget. That might explain some of the reasons for the holes in our ocean exploration. Um, to put this into perspective, on the right-hand side, that's a picture of James Cameron going down to the bottom of the ocean at about 36,000 feet, of which only three people in the history of our planet have ever gone down to the bottom of the ocean. By contrast, the very good-looking chap on the left is our space moonwalker, and we've had 12 people who have walked on the moon. It's, uh, it's strange because we've only just started to map, really, the bottom of the ocean, and we're mapping the ocean now at about two and a half kilometers. But just to put that into perspective for you, we map the moon to about seven, between seven meters and 100 meters, which is crazy when you think of, of that. Um, and also what's odd is that since in the last 40 years since we've been to the moon, uh, we've brought back about 850 pounds of moon rocks. Again, by contrast, we take out between 100 and about 130 billion worth of fish, tons of fish, a year. Now, the variable, as many of you will know, is because we don't really know what, uh, what the value is on the illegal fishing department, because boats, as we know, not all boats are tracked. There are about 15% only of boats that are tracked, for instance, in the high seas. And just I would like you to think about this for a second. Uh, I'd like to know how many of you would like to fly on a plane if only 15% of planes were talking to air traffic control? Anyone? Or again, perhaps, if who'd like to go driving, especially in Manhattan, where I'm from, it seems a little bit... Uh, more comfortable here in Iceland, if only 15% of the drivers had license plates. We all know, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of a speed demon, so I'd be whipping through those red lights as long as I knew that no one was tracking me. But what that means on the high seas is that we don't really know what all those fishing vessels are doing. At any given time, there are literally hundreds of boats out there that are fishing, and that allows them to blow through the quotas, and it allows them to fish for endangered species because the, the, uh, the chances that they'll be captured 
are, are frankly less. Uh, and so that's a problem because it's putting a lot of pressure on the fishing stocks. You might have been uh, happy to, uh, when you ordered that tuna the other night, I think many of you will know that you were potentially you know, ingesting a little bit of mercury. But were you all down for some food poisoning if you had tuna with some other species? Because they estimate that about 30% of all the fish that you eat are fraudulently labeled. That's a problem, I think, especially if you get jippy tummy. Um, how many of you have this in your hand today? Yes, I can see a lot of you. Every piece of plastic that has ever been created is still in existence. This bag, we use and discard one trillion of these a year. What this means is that that plastic, a large percentage of that plastic, ends up in our oceans. And as you can see from this map, we have five giant gyres of plastic. We have, in fact, so much plastic in our ocean that the new state of garbage, for real, has just been recognized by UNESCO. So I think you all knew about the countries, you know, ice and so on, but Anyone been to visit garbage yet? I've been, it's not very pretty. Um, but all joking aside, what we uh, take out of what we put in, what we take out of the ocean is being dwarfed by what we'd be put in the ocean, such as the plastic. Uh, this is a picture of Fukushima. We've had 32 million becquerels of radioactive waste that have gone into the ocean since the disaster. Um, BP spill, uh, it, its effects are still being felt today and still being uh, understood. Mahi Mahi, for instance, they've just discovered a f uh, swimming slower because of the spill. And the spill affected not just the area around uh, the BP oil rig, but it went out for almost 68,000 square kilometers. All of this is creating uh, impacts on the ocean that we're familiar with, uh, overheating, it's heating, and it's acidifying. So it's putting pressures not just on fishing stocks, as we heard today, of a species who prefer colder water, who are swimming into colder areas, but also in the last 10 years, uh, American uh, shellfish production is off by about 40% because it's harder for shellfish to create the, the, the shells that they need in the, carbonate, in the new carbon environment that they're living in. So I just want to think, we've all been talking about a giant piece of the ocean. That's a dot of the ocean, that's one little dot. Now that one little dot on that person's finger contains 12,000 microbes. Each one of those microbes has a job to do um, some of them are food, and some of them are creating oxygen. So the question I'd like you to think about is, if that one dot can do all those things, if you change the chemistry of that one dot, or you change the chemistry of billions of dots, what is that doing to our ocean? So I have a sort of an answer for you. This was produced out of a bipartisan report that came out uh, just a month ago, a, month, a couple of months ago. Uh, with some quantifiable costs to climate change. $35 billion in uh, storm damage, 14% uh, decrease in yields of wheat farmers, 12 billion additional spent on AC to keep cool, with about 100 million expected in the coming years uh, from flooding. Secretary Kerry recently described the ocean as a national security threat. And Hegel, Defense Secretary, described the climate change as a disaster multiplier. So we all, it, it uh, was Halloween yesterday. I'm scared of ghosts, and we can all be scared of things. I know there are things, Ebola and so on. Most of us don't think actually, you know, we're scared irrationally maybe of spiders or snakes. I would argue that in this time that maybe we should be more scared of the ocean. I think that's a really scary problem that we should all address. 
As we all know, bringing it back to the Arctic, the sixth lowest Arctic ice coverage since September, and that has led to the opening of the Arctic. So four cruise vessels have uh, just gone through, and it's having an impact. It's changing things. So what can we do? I'm going to wrap up very fast here. I'd like, I'd like to suggest that maybe we should be bold, and we should be, you know, on top of all the things that we know, maybe we should think of some strange things. So I'd like to propose two solutions. One is a currency, a digital currency for social good based on our joint ownership of the global commons, which would place a value on fish never previously placed before, and use all the profits to go back in to pay for things that governments have a hard time paying for. And the second thing that I would like to propose is that we all jointly own our global commons. We own 45% of the planet, it is ours. And though each and every one of us here are represented by a company or a country, we all each have an individual stake and interest in this. And so I think becoming citizens of our global commons, coming together in one united community around our shared love and need of the ocean might also be that. And I am part of the Terramar project. I invite you all to get your passport so that you become not only citizens of where you're from, but you also become joint citizens of land and sea, because we all have a stake and an interest in this, and we need to connect to it in a new way. Thank you.